So good evening, everyone. Uh, before I start sharing my screen, I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining in. Uh, for us based in Norfolk, it's really nice to be able to do a talk in North Wales because obviously it's quite a long way away from Norfolk. So it's nice via Zoom to be able to do a talk in a different part of the country. So I'm David, I'm one of the Garden Bird Watch Supported Development Officers. We also have Rob Jakes, uh, the, the other Garden Bird Watch Supported Development Officer on the call, who's mainly gonna be answering questions halfway through and at the end, as Mark said. So without any further ado, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So here we are. So 25 years of BTO Garden Bird Watch is the main focus of the talk this evening. And they're going to go for a variety of different things. And without any further ado, I'll tell you more about the survey. So Garden Bird Watch began on the 1st of January 1995. So it's, it's running for 20, 26 years now, in fact. Almost 20,000 people take part in the survey. In 2020, last year, there were 330,163 submissions to the survey so that includes birds, bird records, mammal records, butterflies, dragonflies, a wide variety but that's a lot of data. So participants submit a weekly maximum count of the birds and wildlife they see in their garden. I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along and we also collect data on people's gardens, how big they are and what characteristics they have just to give us an impression of different garden size and what species use different gardens. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a bit of local data. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this is this infographic shows the participants of Garden Bird Watch in Wales and the, the size of the blob, so to speak, is supposed to indicate how many people roughly in that area take part or the proportion. So um, apologies, my Welsh pronunciation is atrocious, but just pointing out some of the larger blocks, um, Powys there, Cardiff, Carmarthen, Pembrokeshire, Swansea, down there. So it's given an impression of across the whole of the country, how many people take part. And it looks like Powys is actually the largest blob in that infographic anyway. So what do people see when they take part in Garden Birdwatch? As you possibly expect, it's mainly birds. So this is actually data from North Wales specifically. So different species are mentioned here. Blue tit, great tit, cold tit, chaffinch, magpie, dunnock, for example. Species you'd imagine to be seen in a garden survey, really. It, this isn't rocket science, to be honest, this part. Um, also one or two mammal records, domestic cat, and some butterflies there as well. So uh, I'm mainly going to be talking about the results we get from the bird records we get this evening, but I will talk about a tiny bit of butterfly records at the end. So, watch they submit their highest, the highest count of each species that they see at one time on their feeders or in their gardens over the course of a week. So, for example, if you were watching your peanut feeder and you saw six long-tailed tits, that's the highest count you saw during the course of the week, that would be your weekly return for Garden Bird Watch. So at this point, it's, it's useful to differentiate between the BTO Garden Bird Watch and RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch, which of course took place a couple of weekends ago. That has been running slightly longer than GBW. That's been running since 1979 and takes place every year over the last weekend in January. And for all intents and purposes, the methodology is the same. Participants in that survey submit the counts, their highest count of each species that they see over the course, at one time over the course of the survey. Whereas RSPB Big Garden Bird Watch is over a course of an hour during the last weekend of January each year. People who take part in Garden Bird Watch can submit their counts up to weekly throughout the year. And by doing that, it reflects a seasonality of records and we get to find out a, a massive amount of data. And I'll go into some of that as we go along. So I hope to, most of you took part in the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch the, two weeks ago. It's a great way of getting in touch with what wildlife is using your garden in January. And of course, given the cold weather we've had, 
I imagine there's going to be some very interesting results when the results are published towards the end of the month. So here we have the 25 year ranking rankings from Garden Birdwatch, the first 25 years. So here are the top 20 species seen in gardens according to BTO Garden Birdwatch plus one at the bottom, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the, to the, just to explain to you what this is, you've got the rankings one to 20. And then on the right hand side here, you've got the numbers that are shaded in different colors, some of them. So for example, the green blob, the 10 for wood pigeon is a 10 place increase in rankings. Whereas a red blob for house sparrow fur, which is a minus four. So that's a, unfortunately a four place drop in rankings in the, over the last 25 years. And in a minute, what I'll do is go through some of the species that are highlighted here and go into some of the possible reasons why they've declined. But what I'm actually going to start with is the species down at the bottom, the song thrush, which is tw was 22nd in the Garden Birdwatch rankings and has dropped eight places over the last 25 years in gardens. So it's, it's worth pointing out before I go any further that song thrush numbers in Britain are actually doing okay in the surrounding countryside on the, on the whole, whereas in gar gardens do seem to struggle. Uh, there seem to be a couple of possible reasons why song thrushes are struggling. Possibly the fact that we've had more and more dry springs and summers doesn't do them many favours because they mainly feed on invertebrates such as slugs and snails and during dry weather it can be harder for birds like song thrushes to find those type of creatures to eat. They may be being outcompeted by larger species like blackbirds and we're finding that unfortunately many young song thrushes, thrushes don't manage to get through their first calendar year so there's quite a lot of mortality first year for song thrushes, whether that's to do with the availability of food or anything else. I mean, it is a bit of a concern. So a bit of a worry about the song thrushes because we don't want to lose them. They're a very charismatic bird. And at the moment, hopefully in your area, you're starting to hear them singing. So when they perch up on the top of a branch and start singing a very loud song where they repeat, eat, repeat each phrase three times, it's lovely to hear it. So I'm going to show a few graphs this evening to go with the species, starting off with this one for song thrush. So to explain what the graphs show, the thinner lines and paler lines are historic data and the red and blue late lines are the last two years. So what these graphs highlight is the change in count data in gardens over the last few years. And the red and blue lines show the most recent data and they also show when these species are most likely to be seen in high numbers in gardens or highest numbers, I should say. So for song thrush here, most likely to be seen in highest numbers in the spring, April, May and June there. But as you can see, there has been quite a big drop in count data over the last few years, which is a worry. So another species that's dropped in rankings is the green fish. It's dropped by seven places over the last 25 years in the Garden Bird Watch rankings. And unfortunately, this is mainly due to a disease called trichomonosis. So until around 2005, green finch numbers in Britain were doing really quite well. Um, but what happened, unfortunately, they started getting affected by a disease called trichomonosis that I'll show you a picture of an affected bird in a minute. But in essence, it seems to have originated from pigeons uh, pigeon species and lost onto the finches and this particular strain of finch trichomonosis is a real concern and has meant that green finch numbers in gardens have actually dropped by two thirds in some areas in recent times which is a real worry. So if you're wondering what effect trichomonosis actually has on the birds, so here we have a picture of a green finch with trichomonosis, very fluffed up, lethargic, unable to swallow, it's really not very nice to see. One of the most difficult things about trichomonosis is it's actually transmitted mainly at bird feeders. So the, so the bird saliva gets onto the bird feeders and it gets passed around in amongst uh, the flocks of birds because finches tend to be very, very sociable. So that seems to be why they get affected quite badly by it. So and it's, it's really not a very nice thing to see. And sadly, it's fatal for the birds. Uh, so 
while I'm talking about trichomonosis, I'll talk about a couple of other species. But before I go on to other ones, there are some very simple ways of trying to prevent this disease from spreading in around gardens and into like other areas. So cleaning your, cleaning your bird feeders is one of the most effective ways of preventing trichomonosis from spreading. So every two weeks or so, take your feeders down, give them a wash with hot water, so and hot soapy water, even a weak bleach solution, give them a nice clean. It does go a long way. And also other things you can do is only putting so much food in the feeders that you think the birds are gonna eat and also rotating your feeders around, moving them around. So there's a couple of simple ways of trying to prevent garden wildlife disease in your garden. And if you do continue to see disease birds in your garden, the best tactic is actually to stop feeding the birds completely for a couple of weeks, just to try and prevent any of these diseases from spreading further. So, and so that's, that's it's, it's fairly simple in a way, really. I mean, just by cleaning feeders, because you don't want to be seeing birds like this being affected. So as, as you can see, this is the, the, the graph that shows the decline. So historic data down here and the red and blue lines the last few years just shows how the count data has dropped main for greenfinch, mainly due to trichomonosis. So it does also affect other species. So collared dove is another one. So as I said, the it, trichomonosis originally is thought to have come from the pigeon family, although it's a different strain now effect that affects greenfinches and chaffinches, but collared doves un unfortunately do get affected themselves. And collared doves, just in case you don't know, a fairly recent colonizer to Britain, only nested in Britain for the first time in 1955 in Cromer in North Norfolk, which is only about 30 miles from where I live, actually. And they're a real garden success story, really spread well, and but unfortunately do get affected by trichomonosis. So again, another one to look out for. And we're noticing a moderate decline in collared dove numbers now, as you can see in this graph here, historical data, and then the red and blue lines for the recent. It's probably not all to do with trichomonosis, but it seems to be a contributing factor. So they may be also being getting outcompeted by wood pigeon and a few other things, but trichomonosis does affect them as it does affect chaffinches as well. So a bit of research has recently been done on chaffinch just to see what's causing their declines. So there's been quite a marked decline in, in chaffinch numbers over the last 20 years, but especially since 2008, there's been a really sharp drop. And actually they've declined a lot faster in England than they have in Scotland and Wales. Uh, so we're currently trying to look into what's caused this, but it does seem a bit very strange, especially in England, chaffinch numbers are dropping. So we know they do get affected by trichomonosis and a couple of other diseases, but it probably isn't the only cause of their decline, but it's, it is definitely seems to be a contributing factor. Unfortunately, chaffinch do also get affected by this disease here. This is Fringilla papillomavirus. It's a bit of a mouthful, so don't expect to remember it, but an easier way of remembering it is bumblefoot or clubfoot, and it means that the birds have these unsightly groves on their feet. So although it doesn't affect them too much, it does mean that they impairs their movement. So therefore they're more at risk from predation. So it's another disease, unfortunately, that does get spread around bird feeders and bird tables. So just again, to emphasize the importance of cleaning your feeders, because you don't want to be seeing birds with, with this or with trichomonosis around in your garden. And just before I move on to talk about slightly happier things, just while I'm talking about wildlife disease, garden wildlife disease, this is another one to look out for. <clears throat> this is avian pox. Here we have a great tip with avian pox. It's got that nasty looking tumor like grove above its eye. So unlike, unlike trichomonosis, many birds with avian pox seem to be able to survive for quite a while. But unfortunately, as you can see with this bird, it probably does impede its vision. So again, it's probably more at risk from predation than a bird that doesn't have avian pox. So this is slightly different. It does get, it gets transmitted more by insect bites than at feeders, but it's another one to keep your eyes peeled for in your garden. 
So that's the doom and gloom done, you'll be pleased to hear. But it's important to raise about garden disease because it can be quite prevalent and cause quite a few issues with garden bird populations. So moving on to slightly happier things, one species that has increased in gardens over the last 25 years is the nuthatch. This lovely species here that loves oak trees and peanut feeders and loves feeding with its beak facing downwards for some strange reason. So nuthatch has not only increased in gardens, it's also increased its range in Britain. So traditionally, they used to be mainly common in England, southwest, so England and, and Wales, many parts of Wales actually, but they were very rare in, North, in Northern England and Scotland. But what's happened now is that their range has increased. So they're actually quite common in parts of Northern England and even parts of central Scotland are seeing nuthatches regularly so a colleague I was speaking to the other day lives near Stirling in central Scotland and he gets nut hatches on his feeders which certainly wouldn't have been the case 20 years ago say so a real success story you may well be lucky enough to have them in your garden they're a beautiful bird can be quite bolshy at bird feeders but always a nice one to see I think nut hatch anyway so as you can see the increase in the species and then when you're most likely to see them in gardens, a peak in May, and then a peak towards the end of the year as well. But it does vary quite a lot uh, according to the weather. So one species that's increased by 10 places is the wood pigeon. So not everybody's favorite bird I know, but whatever you think about wood pigeons, whether you like them or don't, and what you have to bear in mind with them is they're just so adaptable and it seems that gardens are perfectly a perfect place for a wood pigeon they provide plenty of food plenty of shelter and plenty of places to nest in so quite simply that's why we think wood pigeon numbers in gardens have increased so much that they just so well adapted to gardens that they they both find spend more and more time in them and if you're wondering when you're most likely to see high counts of wood pigeon in your garden at this time of year, really, actually beginning of the year and then towards the end of the year. And what we find with wood pigeon numbers is in the autumn, you get fewer visiting gardens because they tend to go out and feed in the surrounding countryside on natural food for a while. So in the farmer's field, so to speak, and other areas in the hedgerows. But of course, most of you probably see wood pigeon in your garden on a regular basis, but you may notice that in the autumn, you, you get summer and autumn, you get slightly fewer, but um, you may not notice because they are quite an obvious bird and they can be quite visible and and do tend to eat quite a lot of food, which we, um, we do definitely admit that, that they do eat a lot and we can understand why they're not quite as popular as some other species. So another species that's done really well is the goldfinch has gone up 12 places in the garden birdwatch ranking. So the high, the biggest increase in rankings of all of the species over the last 25 years. So in the late in the 1970s and 80s, goldfinches were actually declining in many areas. But since they discovered gardens, they've done really, really well. So people have started putting a variety, more variety of food in gardens, such as niger seed, that really fine black seed, and also sunflower hearts. And goldfinches have really, really adapted well to this and started visiting gardens more and more. And it's really, really helped their population. So since 1994, goldfinch has increased in population by 146%, which is a really incredible increase so and that's mainly due to birds using gardens so they're a lovely bird and just in case you don't know what the collective noun for a group of goldfinches is it's a charm of goldfinch which I always think is lovely listening them to them chattering away to each other on a nice and sunny day but a real garden success story so if you don't already have goldfinch you can in your garden you can try putting out sunflower hearts niger seed so a real success story. So when we get our highest counts of dog finching gardens, again, it seems to be mainly at this time of year, January, February, March, and then a small peak in the autumn as well. But actually during the breeding season, you tend to see lower counts in gardens, mainly because the birds are breeding being slightly less conspicuous, so to speak. But 
again a very numerous garden bird and always a lovely one to see so always always night nice to see goldfinch okay so a few statistics about garden bird watch itself the survey before i move on to talk about a couple of other species so i'm just going to highlight um a couple of ones here i'm not going to read them all out but this one is always the one that I find amazing is that so the most weekly submissions from one garden, 1,300. So that means that in early 2020, we found out that there was one gentleman who lived, I believe, actually in South Wales. I, I believe in Monmouthshire. I think that's where he lives. Um, I may be wrong. But anyway, so he over the last 25 years he'd submitted 1,300 weeks of garden wildlife counts to Garden Birdwatch, which does sound quite impressive, but it was even more impressive when we calculated that actually at the time there had only been 1,304 recording weeks. So it turns out that he'd only missed four weeks of garden wildlife recording over the last 25 years mainly to go on holiday apparently. Well, well deserved. That is real dedication. And of course, as well as being very dedicated, it means that watching your garden wildlife that closely, you inevitably notice changes, species that have increased and declined. And also some species that you see only once. I mean, apparently this gentleman one time saw a hawfinch in his garden in 25 years. Imagine that, how excited you would be. Of course, hawfinch, are a difficult species to see. I know that in some parts of North Wales you can see them during the winter, but they tend to be quite a secretive bird and don't visit gardens very often. But this gentleman had one hawfinch on one week and that must be really helps to make it worth it if you're doing all of that garden wildlife recording. Then the total number of individual birds never wildlife counted, 194 million, which is a massive number. So, Species with the most individual records, the house sparrow, 18 million individual house sparrows counted, which is remarkable. Sadly, they're not as, in, as numerous as they used to be, but many gardens do still have them. The species found in most gardens, blackbird, 8 million lists included blackbird on them. So 8 million lists from garden bird watchers over the last 25 years. And then at the bottom, I was going to point out this one here. Uh, incidents of sick, injured or dead wildlife recorded, 160,000. So what that means is that when people submit their garden, wild, their garden bird watch count uh, online now, so me, that there's actually a link up to the Garden Wildlife Health Project, which is a partnership project between BTO, RSPB, uh, Frog Life and the Zoological Society for London. And it's specifically to monitor garden wildlife health across Britain. So if people see they're doing their garden bird watch counts and they see a sick bird in their garden, they can actually submit the submit that report and it goes directly to Garden Wildlife Helps. And it helps us to monitor those diseases such as trichomonosis and avian pox that I mentioned earlier on. And it's just a very, very important link up, really. So if you do see sick or injured birds, sick birds in your garden, you can report them to Garden Wildlife Health independently. You can either do it on, online or you can phone them or email them. If you want to know their contact details, you can get in touch with us. We'll be very happy to pass them on for you. So on to talk about a couple of different species now whose status in gardens has changed, so to speak, over the last 25 years. And the first one I'm going to talk about is this one, the ring neck parakeet. So just in case you're not familiar with this species, it... Um, it started appearing in Britain in Victorian times. Uh, nobody really knows where they came from, whether they escaped from a zoo or they, they were introduced by somebody. But um, the long and short of it now is that they are very, very widespread in, the, in southeast England. So, so their native range is actually in the Himalayas. So they're really not bothered by cold weather at all. And they're actually really quite well adapted to the British climate. So the next time you're allowed to go to London, when hopefully the pandemic is all over and things try and uh, get a bit back to a bit of normal. And if you go somewhere like Kew Gardens, Hampton Court, uh, look out for the ringneck parakeets, uh, or more importantly, listen out for the ringneck parakeets. Because if you've never encountered this species before, 
They can be quite hard to see in the trees, but they are really, really noisy birds. Really loud, raucous, squawking calls that you um, can't really miss, to be honest, even if you can't see them. So there are a few concerns about ring-necked parakeets that they are they may be out competing native species. So there's a lot of study going on about that, and as yet there haven't hasn't been any conclusive evidence that that's actually the case. But it's being looked into, and what we're finding with ring-necked parakeet now is they're actually spreading across into different parts of Britain. So, for example, there are populations in Birmingham in Manchester, in parts of the nor in North East England, Hartlepool, for example. Now, I'm not quite sure how, how many you've got in Wales, um, but um, there may well be one or two, but um, one to look out for, and it may well be a species you start seeing a bit more in your garden as years, years to come. But again, they're a very interesting species and has, have adapted very well to gardens, use feeders and, and, and nest, nest in holes in gardens as well. So in terms of if you do have parakeets in your area or you know somebody do, who does, you get highest counts in November and December of ring net parakeet. So coming during cold weather, uh, the rest of the year, it does vary quite a lot, but it's mainly an autumn and winter species in gardens. But where they're common, they tend to visit gardens fairly regularly. So talking about a species now that isn't quite as... Um, gaudy and brightly coloured but is a lovely bird nonetheless is the reed bunting. So just in case you're not familiar with this species, reed buntings as their name suggests mainly, uh, mainly live in wetland areas and in farmland. So for most of the year they're actually quite a, quite a rare garden bird or not seen in garden very often I should say. But every, in the early spring each year, something happens, which is we know we've referred to as the hungry gap in farmland birds. And what that is, is a period of time when the amount of seed that's available in the countryside becomes quite scarce. So, and, and it means that, but the, that farmland birds actually move to different areas. So what we find to a certain extent each year is that reed bunting start visiting gardens between February and April, especially if you live near water or near farmland. So some of you may be lucky to have seen reed buntings in your gardens at this time of year. So my parents live in Pool in Dorset down in southern England, and they live about 10 minute walk from an inlet of Pool Harbour. And every February and March, they get reed buntings coming off the mar marsh and visiting their gardens and visiting the feeders, which is nice to see. So this is a male reed bunting. He's got a black head and a white collar. The female is quite streaky. She can look a bit house sparrow like, but they're quite a lot bigger, quite chunky. So one to look out for in your garden at this time of year. I mean, especially if you live near, near, near a river. So, and just to highlight what I've been saying about the um, about reed buntings in gardens is that for most of the year, there aren't many visiting gardens, but in between February and April, you get this peak. It does vary from year to year. So now actually looking at this. So the historic data is a bit higher. The red line is, uh, is uh, 2019, the blue line is 2020. So actually last year, there were quite a few more visiting gardens and actually what I think we're going to find in the next couple of months is that there probably again be quite a few reed buntings and also yellow hammers visiting gardens because of course we've had so such cold weather conditions recently that they also tend to drive species like that into gardens I mean certainly we've had a couple of reports this week through garden bird watch of people having yellow hammer in their garden and reed bunting is probably going to be similar Due, due to the cold weather. I mean, we've certainly had some cold weather in Norfolk. We've had temperatures down to minus 10, which is very, very cold, which must be very, very difficult for the birds. So I'm gonna talk about one more species and then we're gonna stop for a, for a little break for some questions. So here we have the black cat. This is quite an interesting species in a way because it's got a very unusual migratory pattern or quite complicated, I should say. So just in case you don't know too much about black caps. So they breed in Britain. They what used to happen, so to speak, is that they bred in Britain and then every winter 
they'd fly south to southern southern Spain and northern Africa and we wouldn't see them in the winter. But what's happened in more recent years is that black caps have started wintering in Britain in more and higher and higher numbers. So and that's actually led to organisations like the British Trust for Ornithology, who Rob and I work for, to try and work out where the bird, well, why birds are wintering here and where those birds are coming from. And so in order to do this, uh, black caps have been fitted with colour rings, tiny little colour rings on their feet, and also geolocators, tiny little geolocators, just to find out more about the migratory patterns of black caps and what has been found out is really fascinating. So the discovery that, that came out a few years ago now was that many of the black caps that are wintering here weren't the birds that were breeding here. So by ringing studies, it was found out that many of the black caps that wintered in Britain were actually birds that bred in Germany in the Czech Republic in Central Europe and then we're coming to Britain for the winter where it's slightly warmer in general and and feeding in gardens as well. So black caps are quite well adapted to feeding in gardens now and will use bird feeders, can be very, very bullshit at bird feeders at times. So we think that one of the reasons why they've been wintering in Britain in higher numbers is because of gardens and well, the climate may well help, but I mean, they're certainly well adapted to gardens. So if you're lucky, one of, or two of you may have black caps visiting your gardens at this time of year. Tends to be more something that happens in Southern Britain, but you never know, you might see them in your garden. So that was what was thought to be the case until, ve until very recently. So a bit of research came out towards the end of last year, which really showed something quite remarkable so just to add to the wintering population of black, of black caps and our understanding was that we found out that actually the birds, black caps that are wintering in Britain were coming from a line that started in Poland and went all the way down to northern Spain. So birds were coming from quite a much larger area to Britain for the winter than was initially thought. So. What you have now is you have some birds that summer in Britain and winter in southern Spain, and you now have some birds that breed in northern Spain and come to Britain for the winter. Now it's really, really complicated, but it and it's only through ringing and using geolocators that we find this out. So black caps have got a really fascinating migratory pattern, and it's really great to find out where these birds are coming from and they're, they're, they're being seen in more gardens. I can see one or two things going in the chat. I can't see what they are, but I'm hoping people are there saying, oh, we've got black caps visiting our gardens, which would be great. So that's a bit about black cap migration. I'd like to talk more about it, but I'll probably, but it's, it's quite a complicated thing. So, but just to highlight what I've been saying about um, black caps that actually in gardens, just to emphasize the fact that you get your highest counts of black caps in gardens at this time of year, actually. So between January and March, so those are the birds that, that are wintering here. And actually, during the breeding season, when you've got the birds that summer here, so to speak, in, in inverted commas, they're not using gardens so much. So it's a really interesting thing that the black caps have found gardens and are starting to winter in Britain more. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing for a while. And if anybody's got any questions, uh, Rob will be quite happy to try and answer them. So I'll pass over to Rob for a while. Hi there. Yeah, if people want to either um, pop some questions into the chat window or otherwise um, turn on your video and put up your hand and I'll uh, ask you to unmute. Uh, there is a question uh, that's come up in the chat. As there is no standardization of the time spent doing the survey, how do you calculate population trends? Is it because birds visit throughout the day? Uh, what we ask is that people are consistent in the amount of time that they spend recording week to week. So as opposed to asking everyone to spend 20 minutes an hour, we know that people like to, some people like to watch throughout the week, watching for an hour a day or continuously. Some people might set aside 10 or 20 minutes. 
as long as people are consistent, we will see the trends in um, the amount of beds coming to gardens. It's great to see how many people have had um, black caps coming to gardens. Yeah, being at the west side of um, the UK, you do tend to see more arriving there, and they do tend to settle a bit more there. Uh, did anyone have any uh, hands up? I'm just going through the camera, seeing if there is anyone. Oh, um, it says Iris, but I don't think that's your name. <laughs> uh, if you just want to unmute yourself. Um... Okay, I'm Peter, actually. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Hi, uh, my wife is Iris. Just a question on uh, infections and uh, feeders. Would it be better for us to use smaller feeders rather than the two-foot jobs and clean them out regular, more regular? Um, I, I think there is a good argument for that, yes. Um, unless you have enough birds coming to your garden where these large feeders are being emptied out daily, I think you're, you should be fine with smaller feeders and you're less likely to have uh, food going stale or mouldy or wet and you're less likely to be spreading disease because birds will be hanging around uh, less. Um, so there is a good advantage for keeping smaller feeders, but I, I, I understand the temptation to have a very large feeder because it does feel like, oh yeah, that's great, pop all the food out and don't have to worry about it for a while. But we are seeing the impact that bird feeding can have uh, negatively on birds as well as positively. I think smaller feeding, but smaller feeders might be a great way to uh, mitigate some of those risks. Yeah, we have a pair of uh, black caps in our garden in Russell Sea, by the way. Oh, lovely. Uh, another question uh, just popped into the chat, which um, at what time of day is best to do the survey? And that's any time of day um, that you're happy to do it. And again, consistency is best. If you're watching for an hour a week, try and do it at the same time of day. If you're moving that hour around within the week, you're probably going to see very different amounts of beds in the afternoon compared to what you'd see in the morning and, and different beds as well. Born, morning if you're wanting to see the most amount of birds coming to your bird feeder, about an hour after sunrise is, is a great time, but a bit more difficult in the summer. Um, there's another question about bumblefoot, which I'm going to look into. Um, I'll pass things back over to David and hopefully have an answer for that um, in a short while. Okay, uh, th thanks Rob. So yeah, there'll be more more chance to answer ask questions at the end. So I've I just had a quick look in the chat, and it's nice to see a, a few of you have commented saying you've said you've got black caps in your garden, which is really really nice to hear. So we we we, ne we never entirely know um, when we talk to an audience what what birds there are in a certain area, but it's it's good 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 to hear. So I'm going to start sharing my screen again, and here we go again. So. Moving on to a slightly different aspect now. So um, um, to the next section of talk is going to be more about gardens in and of themselves and how they are beneficial to gardens and what you can do to try and attract more species of birds and other wildlife into gardens. So, so I think one of the most important things to highlight before I move on is that Gardens are, are a brilliant resource for wildlife, regard, regardless of how big they are. So looking at this picture here, you've got a lovely looking garden with, with lots of plants and things. And we appreciate that in reality, not everybody's garden looks like this. Whatever you, but however small your garden is or big it is, you only need to do something fairly small to attract some wildlife in. And of course, you can attract wildlife in by doing wildlife gardening, putting lots of different plants in for invertebrates. I'm not going to go into that tonight, but it's a really great way of attracting wildlife in. So if you are a gardener, there are lots of different things you can do to attract wildlife. But um, so here's a few, few other ideas. Of course, one thing you can do is to put nest boxes up in your garden. So here we have a picture of a nest box that's got a young blue tip poking its head out of. So if you have nest boxes in your garden or you're thinking of putting them up, now is actually the best time to put uh, nest boxes up in your garden because many birds are pairing off. So if you haven't got, if you've got a box that you haven't put up yet, it's a great time to do it. And if you're going to put it up, 
ideally you want to be facing it between the north and the east so that actually prevents the the hottest the the strongest sun from the south and the wettest weather in the west so anywhere between north and east is best but if you can't place them orientate them in that way then that's not it's not the end of the world but that's just what we advise and we can understand if you cut you can only face it another way that's fine of course you can get nest boxes with lots of different species blue tits house sparrows wrens robins depending on what species you want to attract how big your garden is so forth but great time to put nest boxes up so if you have them or if you've built any great time then now is the time to put them up of course feeding birds is a great way of attracting birds in so we've already talked about garden wildlife disease and rob's very kindly answered a couple of questions about feeders and garden wildlife disease but i'm just going to share a few pictures now of different types of food that you can use to attract different species in hopefully they will find this helpful so you can there's lots of different types of seed you can provide in your garden so in this feeder here these are sunflower hearts they can be quite expensive unfortunately but they do attract a wide variety of species in on this feeder here you've got a nice group of siskins so siskins are a lovely little bird again can be seen in gardens quite regularly at this time of year at times and actually what we find with siskins is that you tend to find them more visiting gardens during wet weather because uh, when it's wet the cones that they usually feed on in the surrounding countryside so older cones tend to be closed so actually when it's wet they come into gardens more regularly to feed on seed feeders like that now this is a massive bird feeder so in a way it goes against what the, the what we were talking about small feeders feeders earlier on but it's just a indicative picture of lots of nice siskins on a seed feeder of course you can put out various different types of seed mixes as well and sunflower black sunflower seeds which the green finch just like as well so if you want to attract species such as finch into your garden, they can be quite a tricky one to attract to feeders. But if you want to attract them to feeders, this uh, putting out millet in bird feeders can attract them. So this is millet here, this very fine looking type of seed there. So bullfinches, they do visit gardens more regularly to be seen on bird tables and can be quite shy, but you may be lucky to see them. And, and another food that that likes another species sorry that likes millet is the tree sparrow so i'm not too sure how many tree sparrows you have in your area if any i mean they've got a very scattered distribution unfortunately nowadays but can be a way of attracting tree sparrows into gardens if you put millet out <coughs> so peanuts are a great thing to put out for garden birds so one just a bit of warning about peanuts before i move on it's very important if you do provide peanuts is that you don't let them go moldy because moldy peanuts can be really quite harmful to birds. Uh, uh, peanuts in moderation that are fresh are a great great way of attracting in a variety of species, especially this species here, the great spotted woodpecker. So woodpeckers love using peanut feeders, and actually, what we find with garden bird watch results is that you get the highest amount of great spotted woodpeckers visiting gardens in June because the adults bring their youngsters into gardens to, to teach them to feed on bird feeders. So if you have great spotted woodpeckers in your area, especially look out for them in June. So while we're looking at this lovely great spotted woodpecker, you can tell it's a male because it's got this red dot on the back of its head. The females don't have the um, red dot, just in case you didn't know that. But of course, peanuts will also attract blue tits, great tits, uh, long-tailed ticks, quite a, a variety of species, cold tit as well. But if you want to attract woodpeckers, either peanut feeders or using suet or fat balls can also be a great way. So neatly onto fat balls. So here we have a one long-tailed tit, which of in and in and of itself is quite unusual because long-tailed tits tend to be coming groups. But suet and fat balls can be a really great way of attracting birds in at, at this time of year when it's cold because they're a great energy source. So I've actually got some uh, fat balls out in my garden at the moment, my little garden in Norfolk, and I get starlings on them and dunnocks and robins and things like that. I don't get anything too special or exciting, so to speak. But um, anyway, 
but uh so energy rich food is very important at the moment especially when it's really really cold but uh when you provide putting food out in gar fat in gardens it's always best to do it in moderation and balance it out with other speed other types of food you're putting out as well and again keep your eye on the fat you're putting out in your garden it, 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 if it gets goes moldy again it unfortunately it can be quite harmful to garden birds you can put some fit some some fats out that you yeah, the left over from cooking but in but as with using putting out any scraps really the most important thing is to make sure it's, it's not too salty because that can really harm garden birds so avoid anything too salty or too greasy as well because that can get into the birds feathering so not all birds prefer to use bird feeders so bird tables are a great way of attracting different species so here we have a dunnock uh, a bird that's had several names over the years hedge hedge at center or hedge sparrow whatever you want to call it they do like bird tables they will sometimes use feeders but if they're not on bird tables, they're usually wandering around furtively on your lawn looking for stuff and looking quite in, inconspicuous. But they're a lovely little bird with a lovely little song that you're hopefully hearing quite a lot at the moment in your area. And they're a real charismatic little species, I think, Dunnock. So if you want to attract fresh species into your garden, windfall fruits are one way of doing it, especially in the autumn. So if you've got any apples that have gone soft that you don't want to eat it's a great way of putting them out in your garden is a great way of attracting different thrush species such as this lovely male blackbird and actually at this time of year given how cold it is if you're really lucky and you put some old apples out you might even get field fair and red wing visiting your garden so we've noticed over the last week or so because it's been so cold there have been more more field fair and red wing visiting gardens than usual because of the cold weather. So apples, a great way of attracting them in. And this blackbird looks like it's got a proper feast there. So it's not just about feeding birds. If you, you can also feed hedgehogs in your garden. So sadly, hedgehogs in urban areas have declined by up to two thirds in the last 20 years, which is a real worry. So whatever you can do to help out hedgehogs in your area is, for, is great. So you can put out food for them. Uh, cat food is one of the best things to put out for hedgehogs. You can also put out mealworms in moderation. So too many mealworms for hedgehogs doesn't tend to be that great, but they do like eating small amounts, putting out water for them as well. Uh, things to avoid, um, things like milk, for example, not don't do hedgehogs very good, but certainly feeding them is, is great. And if you've got the space, you can put a hibernation area for them, a hedgehog hibernaculum or a compost heap or a log pile. And also you can even put little gaps in your fences so they can move between gardens. So creating hedgehog corridors. So hopefully all of the hedgehogs are still very well tucked up in hibernation during this real cold weather, but, ho but in a couple of months time towards the end of March and early April, you start seeing, seeing and hearing hedgehogs snuffling around in your garden again. So lovely way of attracting them in. So very important as well to provide a fresh source of water. So, because of course, like, like us, birds always need to drink and bathe no matter how cold it is. So if you have a bird bath in your garden and it's really icy, just try and make sure it remains ice free because the birds always need to drink and bathe. And unlike us, they can't just hop into the nice hot shower. So not all bird species bathe in water. House sparrows actually prefer to bathe in dust, but most species like bathing in water like this, again, the nice male blackbird having a bath. So you can put out water sources in a variety of different ways. If you can't have a bird table, a little tray, or I saw a picture the other day of a, of a brick that had a, just a little in, indent of water that birds were using in somebody's garden. So getting a bit creative it's always useful to provide water for garden birds. They will appreciate it. And it's also quite fun watching birds bathing, I always think. So just one last thing before I move on to talk about something slightly different was that we, um, BTO had a partnership project with the BBC Spring Watch team in um, 2019 called Garden Watch, which, which was a, a nationwide audit of what provisions garden provided for wildlife 
And what it one of the more interesting things that it provided was this map of ant distribution in gardens. So this is something a bit different for you. And it shows, so just to explain what this map is showing, the areas of yellow and brown are where ants were more abundant in gardens and with the bluer, colder areas were where they were less abundant. So actually in North Wales, there were actually quite a lot of ants using gardens or most of North Wales by the looks of it there. So of course, ants are a very, very good food source for a variety of bird species, such as green woodpecker, for example. And it just showed that in the areas that are slightly warmer and in, in, in southern Britain, so to speak, there were more ants, but just something a bit different for you. You may not find it interesting, but just something that we thought we'd put in about invertebrates anyway. So moving on to talk about a couple of two, two other surveys that the garden ecology team runs. So first we have the Big Garden Beak Watch, which, as its name suggests, looks out for beak deformities in garden birds. So if you look carefully with this black bird, it's missing part of its upper mandible. So this is caused by something called avian keratin disorder. So keratin is the substance that your hair and fingernails is made out of. And somehow birds have uh, sometimes get deficiencies of keratin. So and it sometimes manifests itself in beak deformities such as this. So it's worth noting that many birds with beak deformities actually adapt quite well to, to, to them. So here we have a starling with quite a very long beak. So actually this is one of the more common beak deformities we see. And a lot of starlings actually manage to cope like this and survive for quite a long time. And I've actually seen a video of a starling with a beak that's almost hovering on a bird feeder to try and get onto it because it had such a long beak but it did manage to adapt. So that's the good news, because I mean, of course, having a long beak like that must have its disadvantages as well. But it, it's encouraging that many birds manage to, to, to feed fairly normally. Now, sadly, we do see the odd extreme case of beak deformity, such as this rook here, which has got a real crossed mandible. So most of you will be familiar with the but the crossbill, which is a species of finch that has a crossed mandible for a reason, because it uses that to open fir cones. Uh, unfortunately, rooks are not supposed to have crossed mandibles. This one has got a really, really pronounced one. And to be, to be, to be honest, really, this bird probably really struggled to find food. So it is a concern when we see these birds with beak deformity. So if you do see birds like this in the garden, you can report them to our big garden beak watch survey. It's very, very simple, just looks out for beak deformity. So we don't necessarily have any evidence to say to the definite reasons what causes these, but it may be to do with diet and maybe to do with previous trauma, but it's one thing we're looking into. So, and on a similar vein, we also have our abnormal plumage survey. So what that looks out for is birds of abnormal plumage. So here we have a black bird with a bit of white feathering on it. So before I go any further, it's in quite important just to make a quite a subtle differentiation between a bird that's in a, a, between an albino and a bird that's leucistic. So for a bird to be an albino, it needs to be entirely white and have a pink eye. So actually bird albinos are really quite rare, whereas more common, commonly you'll see birds like this but a black bird with a bit of white feathering. So this is what we refer to as being leucistic, which means it's lacking some white feather, some me melanin pigment in its feathering, which causes more, more white. So occasionally you'll get a black bird that's entirely white, but have a yellow beak and a black eye. But this one has got a bit of white for say, white, white feathering around it. There's lots of different types of abnormal plumage and I'm not gonna go into all of them, tonight but definitely one thing to look out for because we do get some quite interesting cases of abnormal plumage so including this one so this this is a house sparrow and but it does have a white collar and a white cap so if you looked at that had a bad view of it or you looked at it very quickly you may may mistake it for being some rare American species of sparrow because there are a couple of American sparrows that look a bit like this but it is it is a house sparrow I'm not going to say just a house sparrow because house sparrows are a very treasured garden bird that's sadly not as numerous as they used to be 
but you'll get birds like this for example sometimes and then just occasionally you'll get one like this which can be a bit of a nightmare to identify so if you're not quite sure what species this is it's actually a dunnock so this is a dunnock that's leucistic so entirely white but it's got the black eye and the yellow beak and Rob and I get sent pictures of birds of abnormal plumage quite regularly. And to be quite honest, some of them are really hard to identify. You've got to really, really look. And I get, I've been caught out before misidentifying common species because they look so different with these plumage abnormalities. And if you're wondering which species are most commonly affected by abnormal plumage, here's the top 10. So from the most recent results, Blackbird, I think there are about 6,000 records reported to the Abnormal Plumage Survey over the last 10 years. House Sparrow about 2,000 records, so mainly blackbirds get affected, but also House Sparrow, Jackdaw, and then Chaffinch, Starling species such as that. So if you do see any birds of abnormal plumage in your garden, you can report them to us. So again, it's difficult to say what causes uh, abnormal plumage, but what we do find is it's, it does sometimes get passed down through generations, but it's but because the gene that causes abnormal plumage is recessive rather than dominant, it doesn't always get passed down. Oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button, <laughs> gone back to the Dunnock again. I do apologise. So it does sometimes get passed on down through generations, and there are different types of plumage abnormalities, which if I had more time, I'd go into. But I'll move on now to talk about uh, <clears throat> one more survey that we organised in the winter of 2018, the Tawny Owl Cooling Survey. So that was basically to find out how the garden Tawny Owl population was faring. So participants were asked to spend 20 minutes outside between dusk and midnight, between October and March, to listen out for Tawny Owls. And the reason why we did it in the autumn and winter, because Tawny Owls tend to be most vocal during the autumn months, because that tends to be when the adults usually boot the youngsters out of their territory. So if you have tawny owls nesting near you, especially in October, listen out for a lot of to wit to wooing or um, the male singing to woo and the male, female and juvenile responding with the to wit. So they can be very noisy. And we got some quite interesting results from the tawny owl calling survey, really. So it showed that in some areas, sadly, tawny owl were declining in, in urban areas, but not everywhere. And it seemed that more artificial light had a bit of the derogatory effect on tawny owl population, but not a massive effect. And the one of the key findings, although it may not sound like rocket science, was that you're most likely to hear tawny owls calling on a clear and warm night which again, it may not sound too, it may, may sound a bit obvious, but it's very useful to know that if you're going out to survey tawny owls in an area, those are the kind of weather conditions to, to choose to go out and listen out for them. So hopefully we're gonna repeat the tawny owl calling survey again in a few years time, but um, that's just something interesting because it's always nice to know where tawny owls are because sadly they are they're such a um, difficult species to see because they're nocturnal but it's nice to hear them. So I'm going to finish off the talk this evening by talking a bit about our invertebrate data and focusing on butterflies because hopefully in a couple of months time once it warms up we're going to start seeing a few species of butterfly. So speaking first about brimstone butterfly. So this is one of the butterflies that overwinters as adults and can sometimes emerge quite early. So emerging in early March onwards and into April. <clears throat> and so one of the first species you tend to see each year and what I thought I'd show is a comparative graph of brimstone recording rate between two, two years, so 2018 and 2019. So I appreciate that given all of the things that have been going on in the outside world, recently, it may be difficult to cast your mind back to 2018 and 2019, because 2020 seemed to last forever, or I think it did anyway. But um, so during the spring of 2018, there was the beast from the east cold snaps when it was really snowy and icy. So brimstone recording rate was fairly low during February and March, but actually 
a year later in 2019, the recording weight was a lot higher, a lot earlier. And that was because in Southern England and other parts of Southern Britain, it was quite warm towards the end of February. So it's so warm, in fact, it's about 22, 23 degrees in some areas. And it meant that brimstone butterflies were emerging a lot earlier. So as you can see, the black line of 2019 early, emerging a lot earlier. And that's, of course, coming from people recording butterflies in their gardens each week. <clears throat> another species that was affected in a similar way was the holly blue, which is another garden species tends to be seen slightly later in the year, tends to start emerging in April and May. But again, showing this, showing the similar data that during 2018, after the beast from the east, it took quite a while for holly blue recording rate to get back up to the to fairly normal after the beast from the east. But during that warm snap in 2019, they're emerging quite early in May and then a big peak there. But actually, <clears throat> what's quite interesting about this graph was the, the second brood of holly blue in 2019 was actually higher than the first. So they actually seem to recover a bit better or a bit, a bit after the beast from the east. So it just goes to show what impact the weather does have on butterfly numbers in gardens. And I'm going to speak about one more species this evening and then I'm going to finish. <clears throat> so one species of butterfly <clears throat> to talk about is the painted lady butterfly. So if you're not too familiar with painted ladies, they are a migratory species that is quite eruptive, which means that every once in a while you get a big influx of painted ladies into Britain. So <clears throat> there was quite a big influx in 2009 and then there was a really big influx in 2019. So they come all the way from Africa and the Middle East. And in 2019, in some parts of Britain, people were seeing large numbers of painted ladies visiting their gardens and they're actually getting quite far north. I remember talking to a, a lady who lived in near Dundee in central Scotland and she was actually seeing painted ladies and butterflies in her garden for the first ever time because they were, but they were coming in off of the North Sea and getting that far north. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to show you a um, there was some data behind this. So the average recording rate for painted lady butterfly in your usual August is about five percent in gardens, whereas in 2019, when there was that big influx, the recording rate jumped up to 35 percent. So a a big peak of painted ladies visiting gardens or some gardens, not everybody saw them. And then what I thought we'd do, so Rob put this graph together, very kindly put this graph together for me earlier on in the week. So this shows the painted lady recording rate. So a couple of historical ones. And then you've got the recording rate from 2019 when there's that big influx, the blue line. <clears throat> and then the red line is actually 2020. So 2020 wasn't a painted lady influx year. So as you can see, the count data was really low and actually quite average for painted lady in gardens. But 2019, it just shows how many there were and how they jumped up. And so maybe in 2029, there'll be another painted lady year. Who, who knows? We might get one more, more, in, in more, re more recently than that. You never know. OK, anyway. So I think I've talked for long enough now, but if you want to, if you want to sign up for Garden Birdwatch, uh, this, uh, you've got a link here that you can do so. You can sign up online, bto.org slash gbw, means you can sign up, take part in the survey every week. It's free to take part. So it used to be the case that everybody had to pay, but you can now sign up for free if you wish to. You can take part in the survey. You get sent a free emailed newsletter each week. If you don't want to do the survey online, there is also an option to do them using the paper forms as well, which about 2000 people still do. So that's completely fine. So what we're going to, going to do is we're going to send Mark a list of uh, links that can be emailed around, which will include that link to sign up to GBW. So if you, if you have been encouraged to sign up to the survey off the back of this talk, please do so. 
it's great fun to take part in the survey and it really helps you to find out what species are using your garden throughout the year and I hope this talk has, has given you a bit of information about some of our key findings. So thank you very much. If anybody's got any more questions, we'll try our best to help you. So I will stop sharing my screen again. Thanks, David. Um, so what I'm gonna do is answer the questions in the chat. There's quite a lot of them now. Um, I'll do my best to get through as many as I can, um, being aware of the time. Um, so I, I mentioned before there was a question asking um, about um, someone uh, 15 years ago. One of my hens living in the garden had bumblefoot. Bumblefoot could that have spread from them to the to the wild birds? Um, as far as I can tell, no. The diseases that um, most of our wild birds get in their feet are quite different from uh, the bumblefoot that appears in chickens. But bumblefoot is used as quite a generic term for lots of feed diseases in lots of different animals. Um, it's a, a staph infection normally causes um, bumblefoot in chickens, but there's a few different bacteria that can. Um, uh, quite often we find our nest boxes with eggs in but abandoned, what might have happened? Um, the most likely cause is disturbance. If the nest boxes have to be somewhere where lots of people are passing by, or there's um, maybe some predators around, the Beds couldn't often give up on their attempts and try to find a nest um, better elsewhere. Um, so it's best to kind of maybe give the give um, maybe move the nest box if it's somewhere where lots of people and lots of cats or other predators might be visiting. Put it somewhere hidden um, away from busier parts of the garden that may have better success. Um, should existing nest bo nesting boxes be cleaned out this time of year before nesting starts? Yes, I'd recommend doing that as soon as possible. Um, blue tits will be starting to will be prospecting pot potential nest sites around now. Um, try and best do it when there's um, not much activity from beds in your garden. Just quickly take out any old nesting material. You can just dump it on the ground nearby, put it in a compost bin, whatever best suits you. Um, but yeah, best to do it sooner than later before there's any um, actual attempts at, at breeding. Are there any reasons why snowberries and verbenum berries are not popular with the birds that come into my garden? I can't say for certain. What I'd imagine is that um, that kind of food is more easily available somewhere else or the um, nutrients that they would get from those berries, they've got access to somewhere else and birds don't feel like they need it. Um, we see uh, different gardens having um, different foods being popular with the same species. So some gardens report niger seed as being really good for goldfinches, while some people say, oh, goldfinches never touch niger seed, um, but they do love sunflower hats. And this probably has to do with availability in the countryside. And that's likely what's happening with um, why some birds aren't taking the snowberries and verbenum. Um, I have a pair of collar doves that are trying to nest in a large conifer in the garden. Unfortunately, they struggle with predation from magpies, squirrels, etc. Is there anything I can do to help them? Not really. Um, predation is, a, is, is an important part of um, birds' lives. Um, unfortunately, what's likely happening is that the collar doves are nesting somewhere quite visible, so predators are finding it very easily. Um, I can, I'm going to make a guess that maybe it's the only large tree in the area or nearby, so that's where the collar doves are going there, and unfortunately that does stand out to them. Um, Research has shown that um, magpie predation and squirrel predation, grey squirrel predation, actually don't seem to be having big effects on uh, common breeding birds. Um, grey squirrels will occasionally take nests, but actually they, they find it quite difficult to get to a lot of the smaller bird species. Our native red squirrels actually better at it, um, and but they don't have any long-term effects. And same for magpie, these species have evolved together for millions of years and they do have strategies in place. What is likely happening is the nests that are easily noticeable by people are being predated more because they're easy to find. Uh, is there a certain time of year when you should stop feeding? Um, not particularly. Um, there, what, there is some belief that at uh, certain times of year you should stop because um, bird seeds might be fed to young birds um, dur during the spring months, but this doesn't seem to happen except during times when 
natural foods don't seem to be very uh, well available. So um, if there's a lack of caterpillars, blue ticks might turn to feeding young birds peanuts, which they can't digest. Uh, but in a normal year, it's a great resource for adult birds that are spending a lot of time trying to find food for young. But if they can easily get food for themselves, that's that's a great addition to helping them. So I'd say majority of the time, it's, it's completely fine to keep feeding throughout the year. You may want to adjust the type of food depending on the time of year. Maybe make sure it's smaller seeds um, during the spring months, but other than that, you're fine to feed throughout the year. Um, sorry, I just found in the best questions. Um, I get missile thrushes, songfish, blackbirds coming to my pond to collect. Look at those. Oh, that's not a question. <laughs> there we go, one moment. Um, during the past two weeks, we had regular owl visitors in our garden. Can we attract them to our garden to breed? Uh, possibly. Um, it depends on the species. Um, tawny owls are most likely, is the most commonly recorded in gardens. If you happen to have several large trees or you are against a large forest, then it, that's a, is a great chance of being able to attract a tawny owl into your garden as a breeding bird. We have designs on the website um, which show you how to build tawny owl nest boxes. Um, if you don't have lots of large trees, they're unlikely to, to, to breed there and you might be best putting some different type of nest boxes for different species up and um, edging your bets that way. But yeah, if you do have that um, opportunity or potential, then yes, put a tawny owl nest box up. They may get used by other species. They're quite popular with birds like uh, jackdaws, stock doves, sometimes kestrels if they're in a more open area. But you, lots of people have success with it. So give it a go. If it's a barn owl, if you happen to live in a more open area that has barn owls, it's a different kind of nest box, but the same, the same system applies. If you've got the right habitat, if they're visiting, you can put one up. Um, enjoyed doing the owl survey. Uh, why was it not continued into the second year? Um, so we first did the tawny owl calling survey in, I can't quite remember what year it is. I want to say 2006. David might have the information off the top of his head. Yeah, I think it was Rob, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what we're doing is we're doing the tawny owl calling survey, um, not consistently every year, but once in a while. This would give us a, allows us to take the temperature of tawny owl populations to see how they're doing without putting the resources into doing it every year, which does take a, a considerable amount of our time. So by doing it roughly every 10, 15 years, we will we'll see these emerging pictures of how tawny owls are doing and be able to ask them other questions in the future. Um, but thank you very much for taking part. And I'll answer one more um, and then pass back over to the organisers. Um, do you share your butterfly data with butterfly conservation? Uh, yes, we do. Um, all of our all of our information goes into uh, the National Biodiversity Network and the individual schemes such as um, butterfly conservation, mammal society, bumblebee conservation. All come make data requests, and we have that uh, information available for them. And I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much for everyone for the interesting questions. Sorry, I couldn't answer all of them. I'll pass back over to Mark. I, th I think you really kind of answered really well there. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, guys. That's um, a terrific uh, uh, evening, to be honest. Um, you've, um, you've, you've pretty much uh, covered the whole of the Garden Bird Watch, uh, and, uh, and 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 probably hopefully, um, uh, if people aren't actually uh, doing it at the moment, uh, hopefully they'll think about uh, joining very soon and maybe starting off in the spring, certainly going through this year, be fantastic. Uh, and, and I'll forward all the links so that people can actually, people can obviously go on the website, find the website themselves and do it themselves. But I will forward anything that's uh, any useful information uh, that's, uh, that you can provide. And I'll send it to all participants that are joined tonight um, uh, and they can use those links to kind of uh, join in. Fantastic, it's absolutely, yeah. And, um, and really, it made, it made, my, made my evening kind of like a, a lot easier. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm actually doing the presentation, organising the questions, answering the questions straight away. Uh, fantastic. I can't say any more than that, really. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, and I think there's been a lot of positive comments coming through on the chat as well. 
uh, think that, thank you very much. I'm definitely inspired to take part, as says Cathy. Um, and there's uh, quite a few other people have said the same sort of thing. So I think you may well get a bit of an influx from, from North Wales if, uh, and from maybe other parts of the country, because we do have people coming from other parts of the country as well, joining us here. Okay, so that's, that's, that's really good. And timing wise, fantastic. Um, so all I can do really is, uh, is, uh, is, is thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I can't think of uh, anything more. Do we say anything more, Jill? Yeah. I don't think so. I'm, I'm, you've made me even more pleased that I'm doing it already, and I thoroughly recommend it to yeah, anybody. It's, yeah. it's, it makes you go and have a look what's out there. It's really worthwhile. Thank That's you. That's good. Thank you very much indeed. So all I can do is if everyone's happy, and if you, if you make any comments in the chat, by all means, but if, if people I'm want to... If, <laughs> if people want to, to kind of unmute themselves, um, um, I'll allow you to do that, and maybe give Give, give Rob and David a round of applause. That'd be fantastic. Hey, <laughs> hey, really good talk. Thank you. And, and I'll, Thank I'll, you. I'll say really, it's, it's for them to, to stay safe, stay warm, and maybe see you next time. Yeah.